Good evening, everyone. Buenas tardes. On behalf of Director Jordana Mendelssohn and Associate Director Laura Turegano, I would like to welcome you all to this event at the KJCC. In collaboration with PASO, the Portuguese and Spanish Student Association at NYU, the KJCC is proud to present Constructions of Contagion, Sickness and Health in Two Pandemics. We're quite excited to host this stimulating conversation with Dean Albritton and Miguel Caballero, moderated by Lina Meruane. In our event this evening, Professors Albritton and Caballero will each present on their respective engagements with the HIV AIDS crisis in Spain. Following the presentations, Professor Meruane will moderate the discussion and contribute her own insights on patterns of global sickness. We will end the evening by opening up the event to questions from the audience. You may ask these questions via the Facebook comment section on the live video feed or by emailing me at luke.bow at nyu.edu. We're looking forward to a very dynamic and engaging discussion. Please join me in welcoming our participants. First up, we have Dean Albritton, who is Associate Professor of Spanish at Colby College, where he teaches courses on Spanish cinema, culture, and gender and sexuality. His work analyzes representations of illness and health in contemporary Spanish culture as political metaphors of national well being. His current book project, Feeling Sick The Early Years of AIDS in Spain, explores the cultural history of HIV AIDS in Spain through visual culture and ephemera of the time. He has published articles in the Bulletin of Hispanic Studies, the Journal of Spanish Cultural Studies, Revista de Estudios Hispanicos, and Hispanic Research Journal, among others. Dean, thank you very much for being here. Excited to hear your presentation. Thanks, Luke. Um, so thanks to Luke, Alejandra, Jordana, Laura, and everyone else at the KJCC. I'm just thrilled to be able to talk a little bit more about my book uh, project in conversation with Miguel and Lina. Um, so today I'll be reading from a, reading an excerpt from my introduction and also um, highlighting moments from the chapters of the book. Illness affects us all inside and out. We are preoccupied with the movements of our bodies through our environments. We dither over the invasive elements that infect or interact with us. And we worry about our predisposition to faulty genes or the likelihood that our bodies harbor malignant viruses or germs. Even in its purported absence, as when we promote health and well being, we do so as a way to avoid sickness or to ameliorate the maladies that we are already coping with. As such, we all live with illness, erratically and unpredictably exposed by our vulnerability to forces both external and internal. We don't think of our lives this way, of course. When we are sick, health is always just over the horizon, a state we will return to without fault. When we are healthy, it is the natural way of things, our purest state of being. We want to think of illness as anomaly. It is not. In my book project, I look to underscore the centrality of illness to modern ways of being, and in doing so, to explore just how popular imaginaries of life have been animated by wellness and physical vulnerability. Reframing the vitality of illness in this way recodifies our relationships to it, potentially upending its wholly negative connotations in the emphasis of what can be born from illness or what it can produce. In part, such a move strikes against the belief that illness is just the absence of health, a bad byproduct of a poor lifestyle. It also stakes a claim for the vitality of illness as a means to think through what it can do for us and what we can learn from dwelling with as opposed to overlooking or overcoming our often sour relationships to our sickness and debilities. None of this is easy, of course, particularly when illness is real, sorely visceral, and unpleasant and painful. Recentering illness in life may also seem callous, a product of a blithely naive or, or naively academic line of thought, one which ignores the often crushing re realities of illness and debility. Perhaps we don't want to fixate on illness because it's all we can do to survive it. It is nevertheless a fallacy to think that just because we are done with illness, it will relinquish its hold on us. In reality, it isn't health that is always over the horizon, but it's lack. And eventually, entropy bound as we all are, illness is all we've got. The representations of the illness that we call forth daily thus keep us bound to a specific imagining of the way sickness works. In other words, our notions of illness in general, 
and of certain ills in specific encourage us to collect a discrete set of rules regarding their social and cultural meaning, who they can and cannot affect, and the social price of infection. This has particularly been the case with the HIV AIDS pandemic, which has renewed global concerns about modern interconnectivity, social disparities, and the virulence of social and sexual contact. Initially emerging as a niche illness that was thought not to affect so-called normal, healthy citizens, HIV AIDS has deepened awareness of our susceptibility to tricky viruses and undercover sleeper cells, even while significantly changing our relationships to our bodies, our blood, and our national and international communities. My project examines the cultural history of the early years of AIDS in Spain, roughly 1981 to 1987, as it has been told through television and print media, ephemeral products of visual culture, fiction film, and the so-called risk groups that lived through the epidemic. That history of AIDS is, in fact, not one story, but many. And these stories emerge as jumbled and fractured micro-histories of the epidemic. By working with and through the stories that contradict, speak over, speak to, and complement one another almost all at once, my book approaches the AIDS epidemic as an ongoing event characterized by finitude and timelessness in equal measures. For people across the globe, the earliest years of the epidemic shatter foundational beliefs about the good life, community and death, sexual pleasure and physical pain, and sex and gender in devastating ways. Returning to these early narratives in Spain allows us a way of looking into the past to discern its impact in the present. The fullness of the past will always elude us, just as illness will always accompany us. But it is my hope that by turning to the past, we might crack open some of the common myths surrounding uh, some some of the common myths of modernity that surround AIDS, sickness, and its recent history. I began this project thinking that I might uncover some forgotten or waylaid truth about the HIV epidemic in Spain, and as a result, might better give a complete story of how things actually happened. Turning to wonderful but incomplete film and text archives in Barcelona and Madrid, visiting the non-digitized television archives of RTVE in Madrid's Prado del Rey suburb, and haphazardly finding items and documents on eBay or other auction sites has revealed what many already know, that the HIV AIDS epidemic upended lives so dramatically and thoroughly that so many historical traces have been lost blurred or misplaced. I often went looking for archival materials in Spain only to find something entirely different, a flyer for a San Francisco bathhouse, a German condom kit distributed at bars, a pack of AIDS trading cards from California in the early 1990s. And yes, those do exist, AIDS trading cards. Uh, at times, the archives, the archives just weren't there, neither in the place that I expected them to be, nor as plentiful as they may have been, or just missing. The noticeable absence, a suggestion of what could have been or what was but can no longer be found, is owed to a lack of government funding, the stigma surrounding the epidemic and its risk groups, and the sudden loss of so many people. What has survived tells an incomplete, particulate story. These are just some of the thoughts that animate my book project. In each chapter, I turn to the narratives established in these early years examining the constructed stories that designated certain risk groups as more deadly or diseased than others. In chapter one, I examine how medical literature and news reports work to craft a national outbreak narrative of the illness. The concept of the outbreak narrative is drawn from Priscilla Wald's work, which describes the complicated process of ascribing meaning to origin stories of illnesses and the very real repercussions that these meanings create. I trace out a similar process in the initial reports on the index cases of, uh, of AIDS in Spain. A homosexual man who died in late 1981, and in the image on screen you'll see, uh, this is the medical report uh, of his story, a 1982 article in the medical journal, The Lancet, um, which has some really fascinating information on him, as well as these very particular descriptors of how the medical professionals of the time saw him, um, which really sort of lays out how this type of information is never as objective as we believe it to be. 
So I, uh, I focus on the story, this index case of this homosexual man who died in late 1981, as well as two hemophiliac adolescents who died about a year afterwards in the early months of 1983. Though their story comes out after news of the first case, the media almost exclusively focused on the case of these two brothers, amplifying the, those cases as the index case uh, for Spain. Thus, the outbreak narrative in Spain is laced through with prevailing ideals of healthy and sick bodies and communities, along with irregular archival practices that allowed some stories to be buried and forgotten, while others were stationally made into headlining news reports. And in, and in these images, um, I'm showing this, uh, this a still of early frost, which is uh, one of the first uh, wide released fiction films on HIV AIDS in Spain in 1985. Um, and its translation in Spanish from early frost was diagnostico fatal or fatal diagnosis. And to me, this strikes a lot at how these stories begin to be told in Spain in the early, early to mid 1980s, where we have a, a movie called Early Frost and it's translated into fatal diagnosis. And this really shapes the way that people can even talk about AIDS in Spain or the perception that they have of it as well. Chapter two is focused on representations or their lack in this particular case of hemophiliacs in the AIDS outbreak in Spain, who for many reasons saw themselves as wholly apart from the cases of homosexuals and drug users with AIDS. Returning to two of the index cases of AIDS in Spain, those young hemophiliac brothers who died in 1983, this chapter examines how the figure of the child becomes a plot point that is used to depict the hemophiliac with AIDS as more innocent and more pure than others with the same syndrome. Later in this chapter, I look at the portrayal of blood as both life substance and disease carrier by examining medical literature on hemophiliacs with AIDS, the laws regulating blood donation and blood product purchase in Spain, and the imagistic representation of childhood in the magazines put out by Spanish hemophiliac associations as seen in this slide. I spend a lot of time with this image in particular uh, because I just find it fascinating and it, as it juxtaposes this idyllic countryside and the normalcy of family life with hemophilia, illness, and youth. Um, so in this image, we see a young boy administering to himself factor A or the blood product that he needs for his hemophilia. And so uh, this image was the cover of uh, a magazine by the Spanish Hemophiliac Association. And so for me, this family on vacation and the boy's self-treatment for his condition are clearly meant to normalize the illness for a, broad, for a broad audience, a strategy that is flawed and complicated as looping illness with normalcy only serves to underscore its place in addition to life, to highlight mortality and the boy's need for life-sustaining blood product. So in this chapter, I kind of conclude that by framing children and hemophilia and hemophilia and AIDS, that it always places these children in close contact with death and mortality, which is precisely the opposite of the representational strategy that these types of groups had hoped for. Chapter three begins by picking apart the common representational practices that pair homosexuality with AIDS. This chapter examines how certain sexualities became recriminalized through both metaphorical and medical practices, even after their post-dictatorial legal decriminalization. The response to this social pressure was varied, as seen in a number of cultural products from LGBTQ communities. For example, the ephemera produced by gay, gay collectives like Guys per la Salud in Barcelona emphasize issues such as community engagement, education, safe sex, and resistance to governmental stigma and community pressure. Uh, and in this 1987 pamphlet uh, from Guys per la Salud, I find this just a really interesting and gorgeous pamphlet. Um, you see the emphasis of a global community under attack. So it's this sort of local pamphlet made by this Barcelona, Barcelona collective, but clearly meant for gay tourists, right? So you have these versions of it in English, in, Fran in French, in German, in Catalan, in Spanish, uh, and I think there were some others in Italian as well. Um, so this is a text that is meant for tourists uh, and meant to encourage safe sex, even as it critiques its local governments. There's mention of Reagan uh, and Le Pen in them as well. 
And so, uh, and I also love the little symbology of the cities or the uh, symbols of the cities covered in condoms um, and this kind of sexualization in some ways uh, of these images. So the sexualized imagery repeats over and over in community produced materials, including this image by famed German uh, comic artist, Ralph Koenig, uh, or this circular with an image of a nude female torso that includes information for women who have sex with women. Or lastly, this informational pamphlet in which the artist Nathario, who's quite famous uh, for his Movida uh, comics uh, at, at large, uh, depicts a series of vignettes of anthropomorphic penises sharing safe sex information with each other. Um, and the crude playfulness of the flyer looks to speak the language of its community, frankly dealing with sexuality in ways that are organic, fun, and realistic or as realistic as talking penises can be. In chapter four, I turn to the effects of AIDS on the drug cultures of the transition, the stigma on intravenous drug, uh, drug users in media of the time, and the spaces from which these emerged. This chapter examines the convergence of drug use, the prison system, drug dens, and junkies in order to think through the links between criminality, AIDS, and drugs. Uh, and this image I find, or this sort of sequence of images from a news report uh, in Spain, uh, really strikes at a lot of the ways that drug users become represented in this moment. So on uh, the left hand side, you have an image of, an, of a hemophiliac administering factor eight to himself. And you can see the kind of way that this man is represented uh, at home in this really kind of nice mise-en-scene with his sort of business uh, clothes. And then in just moments later in this news report, we see the same kind of image of a drug user uh, taking drugs. And it looks like he's in a cell or in a clinic. Um, the image is a little more grubby and grimy. And, and this is the way that drug users become represented uh, in this time, uh, basically as sort of recalcitrant criminals. So as in earlier chapters, I see illegality, lawbreaking, and monstrosity as key components to representing AIDS in the early years of the epidemic. That is to say that in Spain, unlike most other countries, HIV infection rates and new cases were frequently tied to drug use in these early years, even when infrequently recognized as such. For example, in 1986, newly diagnosed HIV positive IV drug users in Spain accounted for almost 25% of the 111 cases in Europe that year, the second highest total for the continent. In other words, despite the public perception of AIDS as a quote unquote gay disease, AIDS and drug use were closely linked in Spain. The dominant narrative that emerged from the media, the government and medical institutions of the time, however, rarely discussed drug use as anything other than a social ill and drug users and intravenous drug users, I want to be clear, because obviously in this time in Spain in the 80s, you have a lot of drug use um, and that is seen in a lot of different ways, but this kind of quote unquote hardcore drug use, heroin usage in particular, is what really gets uh, wrapped up into criminality. Um, so it's seen as little more than a social ill and drug, more, drug users were little more than deadbeats who refused treatment and help particularly with the advent of AIDS. Uh, they were lost causes. Documenting this narrative, I analyzed news reports on drug users and prisoners, as well as safe injection flyers of the time put out by local anti-AIDS organizations. In doing so, I note how the larger portrayal of different risk groups holds to a well-established dichotomy of those who deserved illness, homosexuals and IV drug users, and those who didn't hemophiliacs, children, and the public at large. Community-led outreach, however, speaks to these groups with honesty and openness about their practices. And in the, the pamphlet here, you can sort of see some of that uh, using the language of the time uh, to speak to these communities. Um, ultimately, I frame the problem as one of ruins, both literally and figuratively. That is, the drug dens that were often made in the actual ruins of abandoned buildings, occupied and hollowed out spaces of crumbling edifices, and in the ruinous lives that drug users were, were and are so often portrayed as living. I look closely at one such reformed drug den in Madrid, at the Escuelas Pias de San Fernando in Lavapiés, 
um, which is seen here in the mid 1980s and still semi ruined, as well as the infamous Carabanchel prison, which shuttered in 1998 after decades of decline and disrepair. And so in this image, you also see this is obviously after it had already shuttered and was sort of occupied by immigrants and uh, used for a number of different kinds of programs. Um, but it really became this kind of hollowed out site of memory in Spain after, uh, in, in this period. So these stories and narratives create something new in the early years of AIDS in Spain, a time in which one could have a jumbled sense of living through history in the making as belonging to a present that will soon be the historic past. In the United States, we've become particularly aware of this sense in recent years, and more so as we have endured another pandemic in uneven ways and across lines of inequity and health. Meaning is made in times such as these. Through this project, I track the making of such meaning, how the stories it produces speak to a larger pattern of perceiving oneself in a time of crisis, and how these perceptions have crystallized into the tales we continue to tell ourselves about HIV and AIDS in the present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean, uh, for that really engaging and thoughtful intervention. Uh, right now, we're going to move to our next speaker, uh, Miguel Caballero, who is Assistant Professor of Peninsular Studies at Northwestern University. He's interested in different articulations of self-preservation and self-destruction. His current book project is on the experimental protection of monumental patrimony in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. His next book, tentatively titled El Macho Antiretroviral, explores the AIDS pandemic after the development of effective antiretroviral medication and the chronification of HIV. He has curated exhibits for the Shushev State Museum of Architecture in Moscow and at the Institut Valencia de Art Moderne in Spain. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, and thank you, everybody. Thank you for the invitation, Luke, Alejandra, Christine, Jordana, Laura, Isabel. Thanks to Dean and Lina, whose work has nurtured mine too. Um, I'm HIV positive and it got to a point that I couldn't tolerate the narrative narratives of HIV AIDS I was getting in film, in theater and literature anymore because it felt kind of like a Sisyphus endless repetition of the same curse. The, the narrative of youth rapid development into not only death but into miserable death. And I knew this narrative was being oppressive not only to me but to many others in its simplification, in its predictable structure. So at some point, um, I guess, this narrative stopped being perceived as merely memorials and started being felt as fear mechanisms. So we, as queer, grew up afraid of this narrative. One reason why I started this project as a more sexy serología for Imagina Mas, a website, uh, was because of my own diagnosis in 2015, but also to get all their stories told, to tell the narrative of HIV AIDS in a different ways that we were getting through, uh, through film and through, and through novels. So this, this project is a mosaic and also a mosaic of uh, interviews with uh, people with HIV AIDS in different parts of the world and also a personal exploration. I also uh, share my own narratives. So today here we are uh, discussing or, or you know, in the middle of another pandemics of the COVID pandemics. Um, um, and this event is called Constructions of Contagion, but my talk could be renamed as Construction of the Fiction of Safety. What I'm going to talk about is how we build the safe, responsible subject in a pandemic, how we are doing it with the HIV AIDS pandemic, and I guess you will hear the echoes uh, for, for the COVID pandemic. So generally, we build this um, this safe, responsible subject as attached to a medication, right? If you hear someone is getting the vaccination now, you feel it's safer, more responsible. So something similar happened with HIV AIDS. I'm going to talk about my own experience. I was diagnosed in, in New York City. And when I was diagnosed in 2015, this is what I was observing, what was happening, a displacement of meaning a restructuring of queer people into a new taxonomy of safe and unsafe, responsible and irresponsible. How does this happen? Um, well, even though I had HIV, 
one day I, I was feeling that I was not being perceived dangerous anymore or unsafe or irresponsible. I kind of regained my tag of responsible and safe because I was taking my medication and my viral load was undetectable and hence untransmittable. And there were campaigns like that, this one that, you, that you're seeing that were explaining this. Something similar, the interesting thing is something similar was happening to HIV negative people. We had a new drug, uh, PrEP, also antiretrovirals that you could take uh, to prevent the infection. So something similar happened, right? If you were taking the medication, you were safe. If you were not taking the medication, you were, at least there were some suspicions that we, you were not informed and hence uh, responsible. So safety and responsibility were becoming synonyms with adher adherence to antiretroviral medication, no matter whether you were HIV positive or HIV negative. So that's why I coined this concept, the antiretroviral macho, because I wanted to explain how this you know, re restructuring of the taxonomy of safety was, was happening. Um, you were HIV positive, on treatment, you were safe. You were HIV positive, not on treatment. You were unsafe, irresponsible. You were HIV negative on PrEP. You were responsible and informed. You were HIV negative, not on PrEP. There were some suspicions that you were not informed on, or, or doing what you have to do. I guess the goal or the of the goal that I perceived is that the the or I perceived that the goal was the construction of a community of queer people adherence to antiretrovirals. Um, so how was this, this was New York because I was living there, but how was this happening or how has this been happening in, in Spain? How was PrEP promoted in Spain? Well, in 2015, we did not have PrEP and access to PrEP is still very limited today uh, in Spain. Uh, the promotion of PrEP was led by a private clinic uh, dedicated to gay men in Barcelona. It's called Barcelona Checkpoint. And what I'm going to analyze today is one of their campaigns uh, that they did specifically for Circuit. Circuit is a huge summer gay private party. It's like gay pride or, or LGBT pride, but absolutely depoliticized and for gay men. For gay, yeah, for gay men. Um, let's say this, this is kind of like a crucial stop in this new pilgrimage of gay people around the world going to from one party to another party, kind of our new Camino de Santiago for gays, a way of some change for gays, kind of this global trip in which you go to circuit in Barcelona, the Madrid Pride, see Chester de Molinos, Mas Palomas, uh, Tel Aviv, uh, New York, Sao Paulo, etc. And this trip is imagined as a journey of love and sex, a come union, C-U-M, union, a union in calm, in semen, brotherhoods being built around the practice of sex, of sharing semen, even uh, sharing HIV positive uh, semen. So these new pilgrims, these new gay pilgrims have their own uniforms too, and the uniform is underwear or swimwear, shiny and colorful and very sexy, kind of like a porn, aesthetics. Okay, so um, um, in 2016, Barcelona Checkpoint, this clinic, uh, collaborated with Circuit, with this party, and with an underwear company based in Barcelona called Addicted. It's a global uh, company too, because you can see it like everywhere now. So I want to talk about this Addicted company, this underwear company. They were created in 2009, and it comes from another underwear company called S Collection, also based in Barcelona, but absolutely global. Both exist today, so they are two companies, and they are targeting gay men. If you go to their website, to the website of S Collection, they say that their purpose is to create a lifestyle, and that lifestyle of this sexy underwear, kind of porn underwear, includes this pilgrimage all around the world, going to these parties. In the website of Addicted, you don't, they don't say the purpose, but it's the same aesthetics, same lifestyle, same references to porn, circuit, gym, normative bodies, and asteroids. There is also racial segregation. There are, there are people of different skin colors, but they are never together. That's also something that we should note. Um, I was curious about why to pick the name Addicted for the company. And I was thinking of the genealogy of this idea of positive idea of addiction. 
And I went back to Oscar Wilde and his idea of temptation. The only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. Um, and then this idea of temptation was kind of omnipresent in, in fashion and in perfumes. Think of Kelvin Klein, they have a whole line called temptation too. But addiction is a, is a step farther, right? It's, it's, it kind of it goes beyond temptation. And that's something that I'm trying to, to figure out uh, these days. So summing up what I have said, what I have said so far, uh, we have this hypertrophic representation of the highly qualified gay consumerist with money traveling around the world, going to these parties with muscles, consuming trips and bodies and, and drugs. Well, this is the, 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 the campaign that I wanna talk about it's in this slide eight. Uh, Addicted plus personal checkpoint by Circuit 2016 is a pro prep campaign in this blue beds with two muscle, two men with a lot of muscles. And you go to this party Circuit and you can pose with them in between them. So you have the two guys um, in, in your sides uh, and in a bed. There are three slogans for this campaign. Love without fear, Stima sen sabor in Catalan, in Catalan. Uh, prep ara, prep now, and the hashtag addicted to prep. This is, I guess, what Paul B. Presley will call a pharmacopornographic fantasy because you are in a bed with two guys who look like coming from a porn, uh, from, from porn, and then kind of this celebration or asking for this drug, PrEP, PrEP now. Um, so let's go step by step. Love without fear. Well, I guess when they talk about love, they talk about sex here, right? Sex without fear. Or more concrete, pills against fear, because love stands for the pills here, antiretroviral pills to defeat fear. So they're selling pills in a way, but they, of course, they're not talking about the, the side effects of PrEP side effects such as loss of bone mineral density or kidney failure. There is nothing special in not talking about those side effects because they generally do that when they sell drugs, at least, he, at least here in Spain, they don't, they don't talk about the side effects and things like that. They just, they are selling it here as against fear and for, happening, and for happiness. So it's, I guess, another case of the banalization of selling drugs, which we are very used to it. The hashtag, addicted to PrEP, this is the most interesting piece to me. Uh, taking PrEP should become an addiction, addiction to a preventive medication. In this context of circuit, in this party uh, of circuit and sex, the limits between recreational drugs and medicaments are blurred. PrEP is promoted as recreational instead of therapeutic, right? You can you just take a Prep just like you take, I don't know, cocaine and you get addicted to it. Um, and then we see a bed and this image of a bed with multiple hot gay men in a gay party talking about addiction. And the reference, at least to me, is to chem sex. Chem sex is another epidemic actually currently happening in, in the gay community, right? Uh, again, blurring the lines between highly addictive recreational drugs such as methamphetamine and methadrone and medicaments. So they are promoting addiction to PrEP in the middle of a pandemic of a pandemic of addiction to drugs to have sex and using kind of the same iconography. Let's talk now about the iconography of the bed because the bed is a key icon for the HIV AIDS pandemic. It's generally the death bed, where it's the icon of the, of the HIV AIDS pandemic. Um, and we can see like a few images of it here. Uh, since the beginning of the HIV pandemics, we go to bed with death. It's everywhere, it's everywhere in the gay sex imaginary, with this idea of Eros meeting Thanatos in bed, right? Um, you can see here in the slides, uh, well, love, in, in the middle of, of, of the disease. And also this documentary that, you know, they, 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 they film themselves like going through all the process. It's Silver Lake, I forgot the title, but it's, it's there. And then there is other image that I included here that is less, um, less well known, which is a demonstration. It's also in Barcelona, 1922, the year of the Olympics. There was a demonstration of people with, age, with AIDS in their hospital beds in the streets. And there must, and probably that's not the image that the major of Barcelona wanted at that time when you know Barcelona was in the spotlight 
and there was something very powerful in those bets because the police really um, punished them for being in the streets, uh, showing their bets and showing their, 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 their disease. Anyways, 1996, antiretrovirals took us out from the deathbed. So it was HIV was not um, uh, a, dead, a, dead, a dead sentence anymore. And now in this, let's go back to the slide of the blue beds. Now we go back to bed with more antiretrovirals in order to have to, to make love without fear. But what is this bed, this blue bed uh, of PrEP? Well, in these gay world tours, the bed, it's probably in a gay friendly hotel or probably in an Airbnb. Uh, and the image like echoes the sex after parties of circuit with couples incorporating a third or, 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 or foursomes or orgies in what have been called the post breakup culture. We can discuss about that too. Um, and the color of the bed is also very interesting because it's the color of the prep peels. This blue is the color of the prep peels. So the sheets of the bed make visible what is not the peel and also the virus in a way. The other slogan, PrEP ARA, PrEP NOW. What queer theory have taught us that the bed is a device for the construction of truth. The truth here in this campaign is a horizon of love without fear, of sex without fear, under the blue sheets of pharma. PrEP ARA, PrEP now means we want this new truth now, the truth of the safe subject, of the responsible subject, the unafraid subject, as addicted to an antiretroviral medication, addicted to PrEP. Said otherwise, and this is my conclusion, the truth of the construction of a gay community of addicts, of machos, anti machos antiretrovirales, the new responsible, the new safe, the new normal, the new accepted, the new settled, are the addicted to antiretrovirals. And I don't have anything against addictions, but to antiretrovirals. Um, after the depathologization of homosexuality came re, re, re medicalization of homosexuals. Olympic Barcelona precedes Circuit Barcelona. It's about sports again, and people who look like athletes. But this time, doping is far from forbidden. It's conditio sine qua non to participate. Doped with PrEP. This gay community of addicts can experiment in sex, in desire and love, but always and only within the frame of pharma. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, we're going to move now into uh, the second stage of our event tonight, uh, which we're envisioning as a, a meeting of minds, a conversation uh, both between uh, Dean and Miguel and their research on this specific uh, Spanish case of the HIV AIDS crisis, uh, but also with Lina Medawane, who we're, we're so happy to have here, uh, where she'll be working with the two of them, uh, connecting it also to her own research uh, on the AIDS epidemic in Latin America. Um, as a reminder, if we have questions, please feel free to put them in the Facebook comment box on the live event, or you can email them to me at luke.bow at nyu.edu. Now I'd like to welcome Lena, uh, who is an award-winning Chilean writer and scholar at NYU. She's published a host of short stories and five novels. Translated by Megan McDowell into English are her latest. Seeing Red, which was awarded the Premio Valle Inclán Prize for translation, and nervous system. She has written several nonfiction books, among which is her essay on the impact and representation of the AIDS epidemic in Latin American literature titled Viral Voyages. Lena, we're so happy to have you here and I can't wait to hear how this conversation moves. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. I am, uh, first of all, good evening, everybody. Thank you for this invitation. It's a real pleasure. Uh, for me to, to moderate or engage in this uh, conversation with uh, Dean Albrito and Miguel Caballero, which uh, I think had two really provocative and interesting um, uh, presentations on the AIDS pandemic. And we're going to try to encompass today uh, also our uh, 
our new epidemic, our uh, current epidemic, right? So we have uh, the AIDS pandemic, which is now 40 years old, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, and endemic, uh, part of our population, right? Uh, sort of living with us and through us. And uh, COVID, which is now a, a current full-blown uh, uh, one-year-old uh, mm -hmm. pandemic. Right. And I think that when we hear uh, Dean talking about AIDS in the earliest period and also sort of what's happening with medication and, and pharmaceuticals and uh, representation and um, the resignification of medicine, right, we, we sort of hear the echo of uh, what is happening today. So while we might not be able to talk about COVID, I think we're going to hear the echoes of COVID uh, in this conversation, I hope. So my first question, just not to take uh, much longer and perhaps to start with Dean, uh, but Miguel, you're also of course invited because you're both working on the subject, is about the Spanish singularity. I was really curious since I worked on uh, AIDS in Latin America, and I know that they, they they were and they still are, and even perhaps today more global trends in representation. Right? Mm -hmm. You, uh, Dean, said that you had found in the archive materials that were probably coming from California or San Francisco, or sort of. Uh, uh, sending messages to the tourists right. Uh, the same thing I heard uh, coming from uh, Miguel, right? And um, and so I wanted to know whether Spain had its its sort of its singularity in representation in narratives, because we also have to think. And I remind uh, our our uh, audience that Spain in the eighties was, of course, transitioning from a very long dictatorship, right, the Franco regime, into uh, a, a new democracy under the PSOE, the socialists, who also privatized, right, started, began privatization uh, in Spain. Uh, correct me, of course, if I'm wrong. So, so I would like to know whether in the metaphorical production that all epidemics uh, produce, right, um, Paula Treichler talks about the epidemic of signification, a really important concept uh, in the early period of AIDS, right? And so whether this, the, the production of metaphor, uh, the, um, the recycling, but also the mutation of metaphors can be sort of explained uh, for Spain uh, separately, so to speak. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that is a great question, Lena. And I think um, sort of thinking about Spain at the time and you, you, the fact that you have this uh, sort of head start in the United States of AIDS, right? And so Spain is, Spain is watching this happen, right? Or people in Spain are watching what's happening in New York. And so report, or, sorry, California, New York, Atlanta, all over in the US. And so you start to see these reports about uh, the gay plague in the same sorts of ways that you have it in the US, but um, it becomes framed as an American disease. Um, just like in the US, it becomes framed as, you know, this African or international or Haitian or because of this French Canadian uh, air uh, steward, right? Like it, it's always sort of hoisted off onto someone else, an other, right? Um, and so in Spain in these early years, it's absolutely uh, seen as an American problem, an American epidemic. And for, you know, in the very earliest period, uh, the sense that it will not affect Spain. And so, I, and if you want to make the links with COVID, you can, right? Because you have a lot of that where it is, this is an Asian or a Chinese problem, and it will not affect us. And I know for a fact, too, that is I mean, that was the story just now in Spain, too, where there was a lot of this is the this is a Chinese virus, quote unquote, this is a problem from there, it will not affect us. And you have that same sort of uh, meaning making in these early years as well. And so it's always represented as this sort of gay problem, uh, gay male problem, as an America problem, uh, which quickly uh, becomes not true. 
Miguel, would you want to add to that sort of the more current representation? Is there is there a singularity for Spain? Is there is there a sort of mutation after so many years into sort of more local significations? Well, I think now the way that the campaigns are done, um, it's slightly different because you really are doing like uh, maybe some campaigns are conceived for the local population, but it never it always reaches farther away than the locals. Uh, we in Spain, or I live in between Spain and the US, I am always exposed to all these campaigns about HIV AIDS coming from all Latin American countries, uh, all around the world, almost immediately, just as they are released, um, because they are released on the internet. And, you know, it's just that there are no, bound there are boundaries in the internet, but you get this information quicker. Um, and, and I do remember that some of the most impactful campaigns that I have seen about HIV AIDS did not come from, from Spain or, or even the US. Uh, I do remember this campaign from Puerto Rico, well, for Puerto Rico, uh, for example, with um, this couple, this is a heterosexual couple in a club in the bathroom. They're about to kiss in the bathroom and she is sitting, she is like laying on the mirror and he's in front of her and he looks very sexy, but you can see his reflection on the mirror that she can't see. And in the mirror, she, he is kind of like a vampire. So he looks sexy in person. And then the slogan is, uh, watch out. No, I mean, you know, he may look beautiful, but he's actually kind of like a monster inside. He can kill you in a way. So he's HIV positive. So what I, what I mean by this is that uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure how, you know, the representation has changed, but the way that it's consumed has changed because we are exposed to campaigns from all over the world immediately. Mm -hmm. And what is very striking for, to me is that even though before internet, before social media, AIDS was already a very globalized um, pandemic, right? Not only that the virus had traveled, but the meanings had traveled, uh, the campaigns traveled, the, the medical language immediately was imposed coming basically from the United States and Europe, yes. right? And still I was really wondering because in Chile in the 90s, uh, some campaigns were about like an old couple where he dies of AIDS and then the, the, the wife dies from AIDS. And it seems like a very Catholic inflected campaign which can only be shown in TV that way, right? No, no bodies, no porn, no sex, no sexiness, right? So I was wondering whether in Spain it could be that way, but I know that the language was very uh, strong, right? And it really uh, uh, colonized, I would say, the imagination, even the local imagination. And moving to a sort of thing, yes. Sorry, sorry, I just wanted to like kind of add to that. I, something I find really interesting is you have, um, I, I think you have to make a difference too between or a distinction between these kind of community produced uh, representations or materials and then what become what is produced at a sort of institutional level because mm -hmm. the kind of like sexy materials that that, that Miguel's even talking about today um, were being produced in the in the 80s in Spain for specifically queer communities as well like I, I showed that comic by Nathario which is meant as a safe sex comic and is pretty explicit and is clearly like clearly has an audience right but at the same time on an institutional level um and some folks may know of this there's this fairly famous campaigns in spain the sida noda mm -hmm. campaign there's another one of the pontelo poncelo which is just these images of condoms and um, so you do have institutional campaigns that become fairly famous that do rely on some idea of sex. It's quite sanitized. Um, but then the, the kind of street level materials, right, or the kind of local materials or community produced materials are definitely, and specifically within the queer community, absolutely highlight sex uh, far more than those kind of institutional level ones, uh, which is yeah. why I find Miguel's presentation really fascinating, thinking about the way sex at a community level continues to be underscored uh, when sort of in queer materials for queer communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I think uh, 
brings us nicely into sort of those two languages, right? The, the official language, so to speak, the power language, which is very much colonized by an international language that is coming from, also from medicine, right? Um, and I was thinking a lot when, when Miguel was speaking about this notion of risk, which you, you also touched upon, uh, Dean, uh, the question of uh, how to talk about risk and sort of the, the contradictions in this language, right? And I just wanted to briefly overview sort of the, 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 the sort of the, the transition between the um, category of risk group which was very prevalent in the early years, right? Which is of course ambiguous, risky for whom? For themselves, for us, right? There's a sort of a level of ambiguity there. Um, and, but also there's an interesting element which is the idea of a group, of a community that is established and connected to the word risk, right? And that was changed soon after to the notion of risk behavior, which immediately, um, individualizes the language. It's not a community, it's a person, right? I think trying to eliminate the stigma or maybe transferring the stigma of the community into uh, the individual, right? Making that individual responsible for his or her actions. We'll talk about the women later if we have time. Um, but I also think that it's interesting to think about the fact that the queer community resisted the notion of responsibility, right? They they wanted to maintain the liberty of their risk, right? It's sort of a, a, a appropriating that language, right? And we're very critical uh, of uh, the, the the words abstinence, control, confinement, end of the party, uh, single partner narratives, etc. Right? And then there's like a third moment, or of course all of these are simultaneous, right? But there's this other moment where we find, and I think Miguel was touching upon this, the, the AIDS parties, right? When part of the community or some individuals of the community respond to fear by thinking, I can't tolerate fear any longer, so I'm going to try to get AIDS, so this is behind me or with me. Now I can live with it. And of course, this is a post uh, uh, retroviral, anti-retroviral uh, moment, right? So I would like us, if you could sort of uh, think about or, or, or comment on this question of risk and how, how can we deal with risk and responsibility without sort of falling into the normative narrative, which a part of that community has resisted. And I think, Miguel, I think you really were touching upon this sort of and maybe problematizing a little bit this sort of campaigning, what it means, how it works, how it deals with fear, uh, and how it deals with what uh, the medical institution would really want. Yeah, it's one of the big questions that I have. Um, this move from risk groups that I still use sometimes, I still I still hear it, to risk behavior. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how liberating was that or how effective was that um, in terms of, well, one of the typical risk behaviors was uh, anal sex without a condom or something like this. And, and I guess a lot of heterosexual couples do that too, but I don't think that this risk, that, that they assume that this risk, this idea of risk uh, was, the, I mean, was about them too. So I, I guess that that was in a way to, within the gay community to think that you should select what you do and what you don't, but I don't think that that notion went beyond the original risk group or what we thought as an original risk group. A different thing is now with this situation with the PrEP, um, part of the perception or the idea is that you can get back to be as risky as you want if you take the pill. So now you have this pill that allows you to be risky without fear. And, and, and I, I love risk. I don't have anything against that. Uh, I, I have you know, the only thing that I have against is the way that this pill is being sold. And I have a big question about how this uh, kind of celebration of risk um, coincides with the celebration of risk 
in our economic system, right? In neoliberalism, risky is uh, priced. Like if you if you you take risk, you 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 mm -hmm. will win. And in a way that that kind of narrative is being filtered to the way that we have sex and that and going back to the celebration of risk if you take the pills. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because what, what resonates for me as a woman is uh, pastillas anticonceptivas. Uh, how do you call that in English? I can't remember now. Uh -huh. um, but anyway, um, how do you say that in English? I can't remember. <laughs> Contraceptive, thank you. Contraceptive pills, right? That you take the pill so you can be risky, right? So that, that you don't have to sort of worry about anything, right? And mm -hmm. I was just interested in sort of how sort of that idea would never occur to a campaigner to think in, in those terms, maybe, or maybe yes, who knows, right? Uh, uh, Dean, would you wanna sort of comment on risk behavior, risk groups, right? Uh, and, and, and that very interesting idea that Miguel was uh, commenting about why how this neoliberal system prices risk even at the expense of your own death right so yeah yeah I think you know you've said so many interesting things about this right now and that's one thing that I I, I find really fascinating in this moment uh, it, or in the moment of the early years of AIDS in Spain is this the concept of the risk group right and it it kind of produces this singularity or these singularities, these discrete categories of people that when in reality, we know that they, they bled, right? They, they intermingled. There were uh, hemophiliac IV drug users. There were um, gay drug users. There were, you know, uh, it, it's not like everyone was confined to one specific group. Um, so I, I find that kind of interesting and, and uh, what you're saying about the individualization into risky behaviors or risk practices um, is absolutely what starts to happen, right? And even in the campaign that I was talking about, that SIDA, NODA, there's, uh, you know, it shows sort of like two little male characters or two female characters or a male female character and they're all, it's, it's all based on practices, right? If I brush my teeth, does that do it? No, that doesn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, I but, remember that. Yeah, right. Like, see that, know that. Uh, <laughs> but I, I also find it really interesting um, what Miguel is saying about the the sort of price of risk, um, and and it makes me think too about the realities of prep and the affordability of prep. Right? Like, who is it affordable for? Like, who can afford that risk? And I and I don't mean. It, or maybe I mean it in several levels uh, of affordances, right? Like who can who can economically pay for whose insurance covers that uh, covers prep and, and who just cannot get it? Who doesn't have access to it? Whose doctors won't give them prep, right? Um, so I think that there's it's all wrapped up in a really, really complicated way um, right now that's absolutely classed and is absolutely about privileges still. Well, actually, yes, and uh, and we're seeing also this narrative of risk, right? Right now, who are who, COVID, right? Who are those who are taking the risks? They're actually taking those risks not because they necessarily want to, but because they don't really have an option, right? Absolutely. Either either the medical the medical personnel, right, doctors or delivery people who, as I read in a, in a report from a friend uh, in London, she, she was sick with COVID at home and the people who were bringing food from the supermarket didn't even have masks in London, right? Uh, first world, so to speak. So the sort of risk, risk taking, and those are actually the, the, the delivery people or the cleaners or the teachers, right? Who were sort of forced or pushed to teach at schools and universities, not here in the United States, but still, um, those were not better paid. They were supposed to do their work at their very minimum rate. And that's why there's so many strikes right now, but that's a different question. But thinking about risk and inequality, which I think is a great point, right? Uh, we know that the um, AIDS epidemics had an evolution, right, where First, it was sort of young men who uh, were able to travel and thus 
uh, were more prone to contagion, right? Uh, but it soon developed into, and this happens with every single pandemic. This happened with tuberculosis, going from you know uh, artists who were singled out for their talent into the disease of the poor and the dirty, right? And that has happened ever since, right? And AIDS, the same thing. Now it's the Afri African-American community and the poorest communities who, are, uh, who, who bear the brunt of this epidemic, right? So perhaps a question to connect to today, what have we learned from the AIDS epidemic in terms of communities of care, uh, inequality, uh, and care is a word that I think is very important, but now that we're thinking about affect and who cares for whom, right? And um, uh, how do we care for each other in a society, right? Even to combat neoliberalism and capitalist uh, economic policy. I, I don't know if anybody, if who wants to start, Miguel, thank you. Can I say a few? Yes, uh, this is so, everything is very interesting. Um, Yes, risk and affordability, that's, that's crucial. Uh, in Spain, we do have a public healthcare system. So the PrEP ARA campaign, it's not just to make PrEP available, but to make PrEP for, for, for part of the public health system. So for, for free, in a way, not for free, you're paying for it, but no, it doesn't, if you get it, doesn't depend on your, on, on the, how much money you have. However, What's happening is that, in a way, I guess we are going back to the notion of the risk group because the doctor to prescribe PrEP to you needs to consider you risky at risk. in a way and, and at risk, exactly. So it, I guess, in, in a way, we're going back there. Uh, yes, and, and a couple of other things. I do think that the neoliberalism prices risk, but and at the same time, sell safety. And I think that's what's happening with PrEP. It's kind of pricing this risky kind of lifestyle. I, I hate to call it like that. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, it's selling you, you know, uh, the appeal to, to, to love without fear. And, and about the last thing that you said, uh, Lina, about communi communities of care, um, my impression is when you are in an epidemic, when you're in a pandemic, the campaigns that are done are never for the people with the virus. I don't think that the campaign, I, I, can't, I can't think of any campaign about HIV AIDS that is about us with the virus. It's always for the healthy people, the people without the virus. I think with COVID is happening the same thing again. I am thinking of a recent campaign about HIV AIDS in Spain, and it was all about this man who got um, on a medalla, kind of like a prize, because he went to do the test and he tested negative. So if you test negative, you get a prize. This is your prize, you test the negative. That's the campaign. So what happens if you test positive? We are always out of frame. It's never about us, it's about you know the others. So I guess part of the care could be there, no? make, make us visible. Uh, we're here, something happens if you test positive, something happens if you are COVID positive too, and, and we want to be there in that discussion, I mean, that representation. I don't, yeah, I, I agree with you, Miguel. I think this is this is really interesting. It, it, I still, I'm, is there a community of care? Like, has there been, have we learned anything from, the AIDS pandemic, it's its a great question. And I don't know that the answer is that we have, right? I think in some ways there's, uh, it's easy to lean into one's privileges and say, well, I'm safe and, or I can stay at home or, or my job allows me to stay home. And, you know, I am okay with ordering dash pass or whatever every night and someone has to ferry that food to me but that's life or something right i i so you know talking about communities of care it's really interesting to me but i i wonder if we've learned anything because precisely because the communities look different than they did right um you're not talking about or or uh gay men in the US or even in Spain are not in the same kind of social situation 
that they were in the 1980s, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in a lot of ways, you know, particularly for gay white males, uh, they're seeing, you've seen a rise in privilege and um, kind of in status or in class as well. And so, you know, those communities don't look the same and they're more racialized and they're poorer than maybe they were necessarily at the beginning of AIDS uh, or the early years of AIDS. And so um, I don't fully know where I'm going with that, except to say that, you know, I get frustrated with the, the concept of, of who is being cared for, because particularly in the United States, I don't think people are being cared for, right? And I don't think there is a community of care that looks out particularly for racialized folks or people of color um, or poorer people who still have to go and bag your groceries and be on the front lines, but are not in line for a vaccine, depending on your state, right? Yes, uh, absolutely. And that's sort of the dramatic part of this pandemic. I mean, I have to say that this is the, 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 the moment when we think about specific cases, right? And we think about the United States, but then we think about different states within the United States. And I am currently in Chile and in Chile things are operating in a slightly different way. So this is where locality becomes very meaningful, right? We can speak of yeah. different experiences. But I was also thinking, and I'm going to say for those who are listening, uh, that we are having a Q&A right after I finish speaking. So if you have a question, please write it up so that Luke can uh, let us know. But I was going to say that um, I think that there is something that we have learned from AIDS or maybe AIDS marked a turning point in activism. I, I think that there is a sort of, Rebecca Solnit talks about this and she says something about uh, how the 60s, the anti-authoritarian moment of the 60s and 70s produced a sort of requirement in the medical community to stop taking decisions for the patients and opening up. Right. Of course, this, this didn't happen with AIDS because gay men especially were discriminated and patients as well. Right. So they weren't heard. They were just sort of left to die. Right. And this is the moment when the community sort of gets together, gets out of the closet in a way. And we could say that AIDS was also sorry, the, the gay community was produced by AIDS because whether they got out of the closet and performed right their problem or they wouldn't be heard because they were a very large community and the sort of the activation that that community produced in order to save itself right I think it is a really a turning point in the way in which we as citizens or peoples of the world feel about taking responsibility of our body and demanding that the state uh, produces medication, vaccines, cure, treatment, et cetera, right? We, I think that there is something where we are all, like my, a friend of mine was saying the other day, we have all become epidemiologists for better or worse, right? But we are more informed. We want to know what we're getting as a vaccine, whether it's the Russian, the Chinese, or the Pfizer. And I think that awareness of our bodies and the fact that we know better, so to speak, right? And we are more impatient now that we were, is perhaps a small lesson uh, coming from uh, the um, uh, gay community and the AIDS moment. I would like to think sort of more positively um, and more hopefully. Yeah, I appreciate that. Maybe I'm a little grumpy. <laughs> I, I am too, but I always try to think about how we actually, you know, after so many dead people, we must have uh, learned something and i think yeah. activism and sort of being together and thinking together uh is 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 there right perhaps not for everybody unfortunately um luke i don't know if you want to uh jump in with questions i still have an, another question a last question if there's no questions great uh no thank you uh we have a few questions in the chat so far um and if, if anyone listening uh at home as we all are uh, has any to add, please do so. Um, I'll jump around a little bit. I'm going to start with this question from uh, from Mariano Lopez, who he, he wanted to hear Miguel talk a little bit about the hashtag uh, gays over COVID, uh, mm -hmm. which was started as a way of shaming gay men, uh, mostly from the global north, who started to travel to party destinations in the global south, like Puerto Vallarta, 
uh, Rio at the end of 2020 and potentially carrying with them COVID and spreading it, contracting it. Um, and he's saying that these were uh, directed to a certain extent to a population that you discussed, Miguel, uh, like the circuit gays. Uh, but he was one. Think of frozen, right? Yeah, a weak condition or re-emerging of the second AIDS crisis and before. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so Mariano was asking about the uh, gaze over COVID uh, yeah. and, and was curious about, you know, these men traveling from the global north to the global south, potentially carrying uh, with them uh, the COVID virus. Uh, and he was kind of seeing these connections, Miguel, with your uh, the, the population of the circuit gaze. Uh, but he wants to know if we're maybe seeing a reactivation or reemergence of, of homophobia uh, and homophobic tropes from the AIDS crisis today. Um, thank you for the question, Mariano. Um, first thing is, I don't use Twitter, so I am not very much uh, knowing what's happening with the hashtags. Uh, it was Instagram. I, it was Instagram, Miguel. <laughs> I know, I know, and I'm new to Instagram. I've been there for like six six months, I think. Um, but I've heard about this hashtag, um, and I can see why it is concerned, uh, you know, about the return to homophobia. I wanted to say that in my presentation, when I'm talking about everything that is happening in the circuit and, and, and all of that, I'm talking about it as a participant. I'm not talking about as you know from outside criticizing something that is going on there. I go to these parties. I love those parties, and I love to have fun and and, and go to bed with a few men, just like in the in the uh, in the campaign. Um, I mean, you know, yes. I, I guess it's not just. I, I think it's about. Yes, it's about the case. It's about foreignness in general. I think the assumption is that if you come from another part, from another country, you will be uh, more dangerous than the local population. When I, I returned to Chicago in September, I think it was in September, and I remember kind of like all you know, the things that I had to go through and the assumption, I, go, I was traveling to a place where the COVID rate was much higher than in Madrid at that time. But the assumption is it doesn't matter where you come from, you're always more dangerous than what we have here. Um, even though that was not the case in terms of the numbers. Um, so there is something about foreigners in general. And then, um, you know, gays in particular, because this lifestyle that I was talking about, you no, know, this this lifestyle about pleasure and not and, and not caring and being all about, you know, uh, partying and traveling and all of that. Um, yes, I have to I have to keep thinking about it, but I, I can see why, you know, and, and, I, and I have to think how I write about this that I presented today in a way that I, you know, make sure that it doesn't go to the homophobic uh, way, because that's definitely not the case. It's actually the opposite. Thank you. Uh, I'll move now to a question for both, uh, well, for all three of you, actually, uh, from Gabriel Giorgi, uh, who's thinking about the question of responsibility that was brought up earlier. Uh, and he notes that there seems to be an overlapping between uh, the AIDS crisis and the neoliberalization of medicine, uh, with this question of individual responsibility, which was mobilized kind of against community and the very structure of social protection. Uh, and so he wanted to know if the three of you could talk about this a bit more, uh, kind of also in relation to the current mobilization of individual responsibility uh, and freedom around COVID um, and, and, you know, what the contrast might be uh, between that and the, the AIDS crisis. Dean, why don't you start? <laughs> oh, I was thinking you actually had a lot to say about this. I uh, thinking about your work in particular. Um, Huh. I kind of lost a little bit of the question. This is why oh. I was trying to, to oh, get sorry. you to jump in <laughs> first, but yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, the the idea of, um, I, I, I would go back to sort of one of the things you were just now talking about, Lena, which is um, the way that community became a way forward through the AIDS epidemic in its early years and activism in particular. And I think about ACT UP, um, which also had sites in, or um, uh, cells, I guess, groups in Barcelona, um, and uh, as well as other like anti-AIDS communities in, in Spain. 
um, that were responsible for uh, getting things, right? That were responsible for ha helping to shift the meaning and shift the narrative of the way AIDS and certain these certain quote unquote risk groups were being talked about. And so I think this question is really interesting and seeing the sort of individualization of care and uh, and one's own sort of mm, responsibility for mm, treating oneself um, does kind of blow up the power of the activist community that was able to get so much done in those early years. Um, and yeah, that, that's my sort of initial thoughts about it. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for helping out because I kind of missed a little bit. But um, yeah, I, this really brings to mind the idea that it's a very basic sort of idea that I think we have, we might have forgotten along the way that it is that if I care for myself, then I'm caring for others and vice versa, right? And I think we cannot sort of go through a pandemic, whether it's AIDS, tuberculosis, you know, COVID or whatever it is, if we don't sort of proactively uh, think about care in terms of the individual and the community at the same time. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think feminists have this in a sort of in a very clear way. Women tend to know more about care because we have been disciplined to care mm -hmm. for others, sort of for better or worse, right? Mm -hmm. For free, taking all the risks, uh, but but also bringing together a community and caring for it, right? And I think that we do learn some lessons uh, from that sort of maybe a little bit of a bad training of sort of sacrifice no matter what. But I think that sort of more radical feminists have sort of have built a bridge between how to how to care for others without uncaring myself, right? And I think that uh, this is why sort of uh, Miguel's talk was very. Um, interesting to me, right? Because it's sort of trying to resignify uh, care as something that you can buy, right? Or something that is addictive, uh, fashionable, sexy, right? Sort of giving it sort of adding pluses to something that doesn't seem to have a lot of prestige, especially under neoliberalism, right? Care does not have prestige. Uh, and yet we need this care desperately always, right? Because as you said, Dean, uh, sanity is not the norm. It is actually disease what is the norm or the threat of disease. And we know that this is not our last pandemic, right? So uh, I am hoping personally, and this is me speaking now, uh, individually, uh, subjectively, I hope that we can learn things from this pandemic, right? I hope that I hope we're paying attention to the ways in which we care for each other as we care for ourselves, right? Sort of balancing out that. I hope that somehow responds to your question, Gabriel. Thank you for being here. I'd like to add something there too. Um, I think I'm going to talk about my. I'm going to connect this to the question, uh, Lina's question, question before about what we learned. Uh, what, what have we learned about uh, the AIDS pandemics? Um, where I learned with the AIDS, me and my community of care and all the people that I know with HIV, mostly in Latin America, because they are my, my interlocutors, we learn how the healthcare system works and how you change to the eyes of the healthcare system when you are HIV positive. I was tested again in New York City, so I was used to go to the doctor as this white man from uh, from Europe and I was always treated fairly nice um, after my diagnosis that really changed so I was I, I, my impression is that I was treated by um, you know as irresponsible by default always like there was always a question about how how it, um, or the premises that I was irresponsible because I catch it HIV but I want to talk about specific experience in in New York, in a hospital called Callie and Lord, which has the name of two HIV activists. So we are in New York, kind of the center of the gay world, in a clinic devoted to, to HIV activists. And I do remember this doctor that I went there after my diagnosis and I tested positive for another, um, for another uh, sexually transmitted infection. And he literally told me, uh, cases like yours 
are why I feel disappointed with the gay community. So yes, this is about individual responsibility, but in, the case, in, in this case of HIV, uh, we are still thought as a group. I was uh, representing a whole group of people mm -hmm. and we have disappointed this poor doctor uh, because you know behaviors that he thought I may have been doing. So yes, there is an emphasis on individual responsibility, but still we are thought as a thought as a, as a whole, as an irresponsible whole. I will say. Mm -hmm. yeah, and maybe I would I, I would add something else just very quickly as a spin-off of what you said, uh, uh, Miguel, because I think there's also, of course, and we're, we're scholars, so we're thinking of language, right? And how could we sort of start transforming the language in which we depict and think of people who are sick, right? And this sort of the blame, the blame narrative, right, is very, very strong, especially coming from the medical community, right? Um, and even when we think of immunology, which is this big thing that we know so much of, right, recently, um, that we have learned of so much, is really sort of possessed by the language of war, right, and the language of invasion and the language of terrorism uh, that our bodies are dealing with, right? And it's very, very hard to change that language, although I was thinking of something that um, Roberto Esposito uh, talks about precisely when uh, speaking of language in his book, Immunitas. And uh, he talks about thinking of sort of a negotiation within the body, right? A sort of a, a, a give and take. And this is, I think, connected to the question of care, right? The give and take, uh, the body being a sort of box of resonances that is somehow alarmed by this new coming uh, migrant that can be good or bad, right? But sort of a more, in, in a way of negotiation rather than an adv adversarial language. Yeah. Great, and we have uh, another question uh, on from the Facebook feed from, uh, from Rob Mayak. Uh, and he's curious, Miguel, about uh, misinformation with regards to PrEP. Uh, which has been so deadly, of course, in, in in the current COVID pandemic, you know, lives lost because of misinformation from, you know, every level uh, of, of power. Uh, and he's wondering, you know, you talked a little bit about misinformation with uh, the side effects for PrEP. So he was curious you know, how other misinformation was spread with PrEP and, and to what extent uh, and how this misinformation might uh, kind of affect the notion that you're speaking of, of addiction. Hmm. Um, well, I think that have changed over time because this is to, this is this, the campaign that I talked about is 2016, so that's early in 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 the prep history, and now and it doesn't say anything about. I mean, it just say love without fear, but it doesn't uh, warn against. It doesn't warn against anything in a specific. You know that it's talking about HIV, but it is no HIV specifically said. Now campaigns about pre oh, PrEP campaigns have changed and they always mention that pre it prevents against HIV, but are not, not against other STIs. Uh, and now what is recommended is PrEP plus condoms. Uh, so that's kind of like the one of the misinformation that was like going on over there. I, got, I get questions about PrEP all the time uh, by my friends here. And the main two things that they want to know is this thing, this, this thing about prevention, but also side effects. And that's, and, and interestingly, the question that I get is, is it safe to take PrEP? Because supposedly, it's a, you know, it's, um, it's, to, it's to love without fear, it's to prevent getting HIV, but, what, but the big question is about the side effects. And the way that I respond to that question is always, well, the side effects are, what I know about them is that they are rare, but when they happen to you, they happen to you 100%. So, you know, you know when you're taking, but that's not, that, that happens with many other drugs though. And of course, this is under, these are antiretrovirals, so it's a strong, uh, but there is a cal calculation of risk that we also make when we take PrEP. Side effects are rare, but when they happen to you, you know, it, 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 it's 100% happening to you, so. 
and about addiction. Um, you know, it's, you ha I'm not sure how this affects that. I think um, what I'm very, very interested in about is how risk is promoted, but also how safety is sold and, and, and this fiction of total safety. People want things to be absolutely safe and that just doesn't exist for COVID, for HIV, for whatever. Uh, I guess if we like sex, it, it's because it's not 100% safe. No, you always expose yourself in a way, uh, but we have like a thirst for, for total safety. And, and I guess pharmaceuticals and, and, and companies in general selling things know that and they, they are selling that, that total safety. Mm -hmm. I also think we have, a, we have a taste for risk too. Um, and I think sometimes the thing that is being sold with PrEP or, you know, I can imagine with other things is uh, you can nurture your taste for risk through adherence to this uh, drug. Absolutely. Lena, I know that you had mentioned that you had, uh, you know, another question that you wanted to, uh, to to bring to the conversation. So I'd like to invite you to launch that last one. And uh, then no, we can I, close I up think the actually, event. I think I actually um, w wanted to say something about. This is very brief, actually, about women. Uh, the fact that we speak about AIDS and we rarely speak about women, right? And um, I wanted to ask a question, but I kind of the question went in a different direction. And, uh, but we were talking about this with Jordana the other day, <clears throat> uh, that it seems that diseases and everything else always happens to men, right? Either straight or gay or trans, but never, never to, to women, right? Never to uh, especially to conservative women or to traditional women mm -hmm. or even to girls. So, um, so I just wanted to perhaps maybe end because it's also uh, getting too late uh, to say that I think that it's an interesting uh, to think about and to start talking more about how uh, women are um, invisible in the narratives of disease mostly, unless it's cancer, because cancer is a feminine uh, disease, or somehow the metaphors always go there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but unless it's it's um, unless it's cancer and uh, a, a disease connected to the repression of the expression of self, right? Um, and especially with pandemics, which are uh, diseases of travel, right? Of of connection of the um, of the, uh, not the private world, but the public world, which is inhabited by men supposedly only, right? We do get this sort of gendered representation. So I don't know, I just wanted to, to throw that out maybe in ending and maybe if some uh, NYU students uh, are interested in the theme, thinking more about like how do women appear or disappear in the representation of pandemics. I add something very briefly. Um, I want to say that some of my um, edgier, edgiest and, and strongest uh, interlocutors are, are women with HIV, mostly in Latin America. There's a huge network of women with HIV doing some very, very amazing things. And they, uh, I, I've learned from them many different things, but they, um, um, they, you know, they talk also about specific ways in which this HIV AIDS pandemic is affecting them. Of course, there is a very specific kind of a stigma that goes to you if you're a woman with HIV, mm -hmm. and it has to do about your sexual life and, your, your, and all of that. But also, um, you know, specific issues such as um, being pregnant with HIV, breastfeeding with HIV. So there is a huge mo movement of, of women with HIV discussing those issues. And we'll, we'll definitely have to talk about that more too. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much uh, to, to all three of you. Um, 
I have millions of other questions, but I'm going to save them for the reception that we will need to have at some point one day uh, in person. Um, but no, I just wanted to, to thank the three of you for being here, to thank our production crew, uh, and to thank everyone else who tuned in, whether on Facebook Live or on YouTube. Uh, and on behalf of the KJCC, just to show our appreciation uh, for all of you, and we look forward to more productive conversations in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, thanks.